What follows is an insightful sports-based conversation with storied Michigan-based sports writer and good friend, Lynn Henning. How long were you a sports writer, Lynn? 45 years uh, full-time, still involved, so pretty close to 50 years. Wow. Uh, if you want to begin to consider from the time of college, which is about when I would consider it. Who or what sports teams have you covered? I began in Michigan and had my whole career in Michigan. So first job out of Michigan State was with the Battle Creek Inquirer. And I'd cover uh, high schools there, a little Michigan, Michigan State, and some of the Detroit pro sports teams, too. I'd get down for weekends and get material from there and do stories out of Detroit fairly frequently. So I had a nice mix. And then after one year, I went to the Lansing State Journal, where I worked part-time during my Michigan State days. They brought me up full-time. And then I covered Magic Johnson and Kirk Gibson and all those guys during those years up there at Michigan State. And then uh, in 1979, when I was 26, went to Detroit to the Detroit News, covered Major League Baseball, the Tigers, helped out Lions, Pistons, Red Wings, Michigan, Michigan State. I covered a lot of that and pretty much was in the general mix. Were you in college with or at the same time as Magic Johnson and Kirk Gibson? No, I was just before them. They got in there, Kirk, in 75. I was graduated in 74, and Magic came in 77. They just followed me a little bit. I covered them, obviously, because they were in Lansing. Magic as a high schooler there before I went to Michigan State, and then Kirk Gibson as a Michigan State freshman in 1975. So I was with those guys all the way through. There's a lot to go over there, but I wanted to carry through the entire timeline of your career, and then we'll go back to Points of significance. There were a lot of them. So you went from Lansing to Detroit, mm -hmm. and then you made your whole career there, right? In Detroit. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, right. The next 40 years were spent in Detroit. I, I took a couple of what you might call sabbaticals. I was editor of the PGA's National Golf Magazine for five years. I did that because I was on the road so much. Yeah. My young son was only a year old, and I knew that was going to be trouble. So I backed away for five years and then uh, went back to the paper and was happy. And then we ran into a strike, Detroit newspaper strike that had 2,000 people out. And I was one of those 2,000 people for three years. And during that time, I worked for Golf Week out of Orlando, but I could still stay based in Detroit and covered uh, with a terrific crew of journalists, golf for Golf Week. I worked the business side of golf uh, during those three years. So other than that, everything else has been at the Detroit News since 1979. And I still work for them, even though I'm retired officially, three and a half years. I still work uh, a story or two a week generally for the Detroit News, still in retirement. It's been very, very nice. And here we are, coastal Georgia. Mm -hmm. That's very, very nice. Working at it for a publication out of Detroit. As you think in a very cursory manner over the course of your career, who are some people you cover? Who sticks out? It's, it's a long list, Jason. Um, uh, Kurt Gibson was always the most fascinating guy I covered because he was All-American in two sports and would have been the first overall draft pick in two sports. Oh, uh, that's and something few people know. Few people know. He, yeah. he, before baseball, he was a star receiver and was going to go first in the NFL draft. 6'3", 220, ran a 4 2 eight, 40. That's ran, He of. ran that for pro that's scouts. Nice. And people don't understand that. And so he went out for baseball simply because his football coach, Joe Rogers, said, look, I don't need you for spring ball. The baseball coach knew he'd played a little bit as a teenager, thought he could probably help. So he went out just kind of as a lark. It connected as only it could connect with Kirk Gibson. He destroyed the baseball. And next thing, uh, teams won him uh, first overall in the, in the NF MLB draft. They were not sure about – him going to the NFL because he was coming back for his senior year, even after he signed as a uh, junior at Michigan State. That year's draft, he still had football eligibility left. He was coming back, and teams were not sure that he wasn't going to play football still. So they backed away. That's why the Tigers got him in the 12th overall pick. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he was going to go 1-1 one, one in both drafts. Not many people really remember that. So articulating that, had he not – agreed to go back to school to play football, he would have gotten picked first in baseball and football. More, more of the point was at that, at that time, what you could do is you could sign in one sport and still play other sports. That had not been the case as a, some collegiate, reserve, athlete. As a collegiate athlete. 
And he felt he had an obligation to his teammates. He was not planning on playing pro football, but he felt he had an obligation to his teammates to come back. Well, that was the most fun I've ever had covering a football team. Yeah. They tied for the Big Ten Championship, and Kirk Gibson was Kirk Gibson. They were a tremendous football team. And yet, he'd already played one summer of minor league ball and was going to join the Tigers uh, at spring training and after his senior year. So that's how that all went. Yeah. That's incredibly interesting for someone like me who, and, and my memory of Kirk Gibson is hitting a home run to win game one of 88 World Series. Yeah. Never knew he played a down of football. Never knew one way or the other. He was beyond belief. Again, the size, 6'3", 220, a 4 two, eight, four. That's insane. Uh, you, you can get the occasional 4'3", three, little, a tick or two beneath 4'3", but in 1978, to do that. And how did he stack up Heisman-wise, Kirk Gibson? Back then, it was all quarterbacks. Okay. He would have had more support in this time and era, but it was still a quarterback uh, award back then. And it, the fact, too, that he had played baseball uh, probably uh, precluded him being considered seriously that year for the Heisman. I I've covered a couple Olympics. You know, I covered golf. That, that is a very good question. Who's the most dynamic athlete? He was. Uh, Kirk Gibson. Uh, and what you see in that replay uh, of that uh, home run that he hit in, the, in game one of the 88 series is reflective of who Kirk Gibson was, is, and what he was able to do at critical moments throughout his career. He also had, and this surprises people more, an intellect every bit as facile as his physical skill. Not many people realize that. The most brilliant athlete I've ever covered, too. Really? Put together incredibly spontaneous, flawless, seamless sentences, very intelligent and very evocative. And uh, I always said about Gibson, he never gave you one word that was a wasteful word, one that you wouldn't put into a story or, or quote him on. Every word he, he ever articulated counted. He just had that ability to synthesize and refine word. Well, that's what also made him a great businessman uh, in his later years. And made him an airplane pilot too. He's he an airplane could, pilot. He'd go on Tigers road trips and at night go back to the hotel and read aeronautics books. <clears throat> Taught himself how to fly you know, with the proper instructors and, and was a private pilot. So this is like <clears throat> Bill Brasky or one of these imaginary Paul Bunyan or he was at Forrest Gump or something. Just could amazing do it all. Amazing dimension. Mother was a Drama and English teacher, okay. father, uh, an accountant, a yeah. mathematical mind. So that melding of all of those uh, intellectual properties really came out in Kirk, too. Wow, that's fascinating. Aside from the home run, the 88 World Series, his performance stick out for you as like a seminal work of his that you yeah. thought this guy is so special. It was uh, 1978. They were playing uh, Wisconsin. There was an interception. He, he was running a left corner route into the corner of the left corner in the end zone. Let's say from the 10 yard line was the play. Eddie Smith, the quarterback threw to the right side and it was intercepted by a linebacker, Minnesota, I believe, not Wisconsin. Now this guy's got a head start down the left sideline while Gibson's in the corner of the right end zone. And this guy's lumbering down the sideline that's gonna score. Gibson wheeled in the left corner of the end zone, chased and chased and chased and threw him out of bounds at the 20 yard line of Michigan State, they froze the time frames on that and concluded he covered 80 yards in seven seconds. Oh. It was the most stunning play they had ever, coaching staff had ever seen in their lives. Yeah. And I saw it too. You're a person. Oh, I was right there. Did you talk to him afterward? Oh, of course. What did, do you remember what he said? Well, he, you know, for Gibson, that was just what he did. Yeah, that's, that was playing football. But yeah, I used to be able to go to practice every night and they were right. They'd do sprints at the end. His spikes would throw up dirt on you, like a horse at Churchill Downs. Sand and dirt, that's how powerful he was. I remember he had some knee surgery as a rookie with the Tigers. And the uh, orthopedic surgeon told me it was like, his ligaments were like horse ligaments. He'd never seen him like that. Really? So he's an, he, he is an extraordinary, was and, and remains an extraordinary, athlete the most in my yes. 
the most you've seen. Uh, and all those elements. Yeah, yeah. In levels. He was uncanny. Was he a savant? Was he obsessive? <laughs> or was he some athletes from 50s, 60s, 70s? You look back and you think about Joe Namath, who might have gone out the night before a game and then thrown a career passing yards game the next day. You think of other players who you know, maybe had a lot of grit during the game, but the preparation it wasn't what you might see from Tim Tebow or somebody that's really Bryce Young or somebody. What was his disposition toward his craft? Fearless, intense, focused. And that's why I was able to do those things. That's why the title of his book, which I co-wrote with him, is Bottom of the Ninth, because he did this all the time. Yeah. He, he never was able to less than meet the moment. And he had a imagination versus relaxation. He'd gotten this during some off-season training would create the kind of, uh, of, of outcome. You could visualize, concentrate, and then get the outcome to actually match your vision. He had that figured out. And he did. That's what he did routinely, simply beyond comprehension. And um, on top of that, uh, just a, a, an enormously bright guy. Now, people didn't think of this because he was the first to say, I majored in eligibility. In other yeah. words, the structure of the classroom was not his thing, but his IQ and his brilliance was off the chart. Really, it's fascinating to talk about him. As somebody who most people like me, who considers myself a fairly knowledgeable sports fan, thinks of him as a baseball player. Yeah, he wasn't a heavy recruit coming out of high school. He was actually found on film by an assistant coach at Michigan State who was checking film to see another player. And then they saw this guy, <clears throat> just a second here, and he was going to go to Central Michigan University until the Michigan State coach saw him, invited him up, and they uh, signed him to a tender. He was not heavily recruited. So he was a person who flowered uh, a little later, but uh, from the moment he was the first day freshman at Michigan State, he started. That's how good he came in with his speed and with his discipline. And that summer he had just put himself through grueling high school track workout, 220 yards and, and just burned to a point of submission. So he came to first day of practice and he's faster than anybody on the team. So he started from day one, and then the next year they brought in a throwing quarterback, Eddie Smith, and made him the QB in 76, 77, 78. He was unstoppable. Back then, was it unconventional to start a freshman in college? Unusual. They'd only had freshman eligibility at that point for three years. Before 1972, they had no freshman eligibility in basketball or, or, or football. You couldn't play if you were a freshman? No. And they changed that in 72. And so it was only three years into that that Kirk Gibson uh, is an automatic starter as a freshman. So as a pure athlete, a high-level performer in two sports, he takes the cake. And I think that's an underappreciated thing among sports fans these days. How would he rank among all-time baseball players? Well, he's he had 17-year career, and that was part of the reason he focused on football. He or, Baseball, he knew he could have more longevity. Yeah. Again, the business mind, he was yeah. smart. He knew football had a shelf life. And he wanted the long-term professional experience. He had 17 seasons, so that was smart. Now, you can look at other double sport athletes. Deion Sanders, Bo Jackson. Gibson was right there. He was that. Oh, he would, he would have been. Yeah. Had he played football, you think he would have oh, been oh, up there oh, with Deion oh. Bo Jackson. That is such an underappreciated thing. It, that's that's what is common. And I love yeah, Dion and I love Bo, both of those guys. Dion was my hero. Gibson was unstoppable. Yeah, that size, that speed, and when he got the ball, he was a locomotive. He loved hitting guys, and that separated him from the pack too. A lot of guys don't like going across the middle. Yes. Oh, he lived for it. He lived for it. Yeah. He wanted to outblast you. Any defenders had any idea? Oh no, he'd outblast. You. When you ask who was number one, Kurt Gibson. Kurt Gibson was the best two-sport athlete that you've ever seen. Absolutely. And you've seen a lot of a lot of great athletes. Tell the story of game one of the 88 World Series because I'm 39 now. I've got a vague memory of this guy coming in and hitting a home run, but I don't think a lot of people realize what happened before in that game that got him off the bench to hit a home run. Well, he, he was crippled, incapacitated. Yeah. Literally, a bad knee and a hamstring that was a mess. So on each leg, he 
could not, when he got up that morning, walk across the bedroom floor. That's how paralytic were those injuries. He wasn't going to play. No way was he going to play that game. Still went. By that point, he's at least trying to do some stuff on the bike, but he's not going to play. They get to the ninth inning. They're down a run. Get a man on base. And Tommy Lasorda, manager of the Dodgers at the time. Of course, he knows what he wants to do, but I can't play Kirk. He can't move. Kirk told the clubhouse guy, go tell Tommy if he needs me, I'll, I'll give it a try. Sure enough, he hobbles down, grabs a bat, lopes across. And, of course, the crowd's going wild at Dodger Stadium. Yeah. But there's no way he can – he can't even – on these legs, he can't get around on a pitch. Works the count to 3-2, fouls off a couple of pitches. Works the count to 3-2. And the Dodgers scout, Mel Didier, professional scout, they go out and they see what the other teams in baseball are doing. And part of his scouting report to Gibson was, if Dennis Eckersley is in this game as the, re, as the closer and you get him to 3-2, he says, he is going to throw you a backdoor slider. Sure as a world, he says, he's going to throw it. On 3-2, a backdoor slider. Gibson, remember what Mel said. Guess what comes? A backdoor slider, and Gibson crushes it into the right field seats. Now, had it been a fastball, Gibson was the first to say he, he couldn't have, he wouldn't have been able to get around on an Eckersley fastball. That gives me chills. This cool was story. This this was Kirk Gibson. I saw this kind of thing happen with him over and over and yeah. over again. He he was able at peak and dramatic moments to reach his optimum. But I'll never forget too, I was sitting with him at spring training in 1986, just in the dugout, it's casual atmosphere, of course, at spring training. Yes. One day, well before the game started, we we're just talking and he mentioned that day he was gonna break the world altitude record in his Cessna. All Went right. Back to his piloting. Okay. Gonna leave the Lakeland airport and climb to this high altitude with his Cessna. For that class, it was going to be the world altitude record. Wow. This is kind of interesting. This make for a good little story. Yeah. Today. But I had to get the Tigers brass reaction to this, too. So I went over to the office, near the offices, and Jim Campbell was then the GM was just coming out the door. I said, Jim, I said, did you know Kirk was today going to break the world altitude record in his Cessna? And Campbell, who was old school, he just started rumbling almost like a volcano. <laughs> Nothing anymore surprises me about anything. <laughs> it was Jim Campbell waving the white flag on that modern era ball player. Yeah. In this case, his superstar who was going to try to break the right. world out. Now his wife did finally talk him out of flying a more plane. Yeah. The Thurman Munson accident, some other things have come up. And uh, who's Thurman Munson? Thurman Munson was the Yankees catcher who died in the private plane okay. crash yeah. in 1979. Okay. And she was worried. And Kirk had three boys and a great marriage with Joanne, which they still have 37 years later. And she was worried. And so he, he did. He gave up the plane as a concession to her wishes. And probably was a good thing because we have too many instances of. Yeah. Too many high profile. Yeah. We had private plane crashes. We know too much about that around here. Well, it, yeah. It, 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 yeah. And, and this was just something that still pointed out to his dimension. And then he became a fabulous businessman, real estate, and, and I mean, stocks. This guy who they thought was just a jack student, which he was. He wasn't really plugged into any interest level in, in the class, but he had this amazing mind and this incredible thousand watt intellect. So yeah, that's the reason he was the most fascinating athlete of the country. Yeah. Because so few people I think know that, especially in this part of the country. Yes. Well, gosh, how do we move on from that? Moving on, Kurt Gibson won. And then oh. moving forward, I know there were some instances of greatness, I guess you would call it, that you were witness to. There was a story about Reggie Jackson, right? Oh yeah, Reggie. I was at the 1971 All-Star Game. I was 19 when he hit the longest home run that any of us uh, have yet seen against the light tower atop Tiger Stadium. Oh, he 90, had lights. 90 feet in the air. He hit a transformer that was on the roof, and it was going like this when it hit the transformer. Everyone believes it, it would have been 
potentially a 600 foot hole. <laughs> yeah. They even had the, the people plot the arc and yeah. the speed and they worked that out. It's 15 years later and I'm now covering baseball, of course, for the Detroit News. And I was doing a baseball column that week. Reggie's in his, with the Los Angeles Angels at this point. As a player. Oh, yeah, still yeah. playing. But it looks like it's going to be his last year. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a baseball column, one of those things where it's not one subject, but I was doing different kind of different vignettes yeah. for a column, different subjects, topics. And one of them I said, I said, by the way, uh, folks, Reggie's coming in with the Angels this week. And he hasn't said anything about retirement, but it looks like it could be the case. I said, this might be your last hurrah with, to see Reggie. And I just wrote, I said, he's always returned, I said, more on the entertainment dollar than any athlete I've ever covered. And that's yeah. still true. Still true. And so I said, he's done it forever. I said, for those of us who were at Tiger Stadium in 1971 and saw him hit the home run, I said, we'll never forget. I said, in particular, I said, even the sound, and I italicized the word sound, yeah, just to emphasize, because it sounded like an artillery shell. Yeah. It. I said, as that ball rocketed into the heavens, and those were the words I used, I said, rocketed into the heavens. I said, we'll never forget that moment. That weekend comes in, he comes into play. I'm getting off the golf course in Ann Arbor. It's a day off, driving home, and I hear the Tigers, Walt Terrell is their pitcher, and he's got a no-hitter. Well, I know there's probably only – one guy down there covering the game. I call the office. Sure enough, okay, can you help, please? We're staring down the barrel of a no-hitter here. I'll be right down. Get down there. You drive from Ann Arbor to Detroit. Uh, actually, between Ann Arbor and Northville, to be precise. But I had a half-hour drive. Yeah. I get, and, and the no-hitter's still going. Get there, park. Get on the press box elevator. And just as I get to the press box, there's two out in the ninth that's still going. Wally Joyner hits a double down the right field line. No hitter gone. No hitter gone. So we did win a couple people, but I said, look, I'll take care of the Angels clubhouse. I'll talk to Joyner and to the people down there on that end about this near no hitter while they get the Tigers stuff. I went over and I was waiting around for Joyner to come back to talk to us. And I get a tap on the shoulder and it's Reggie. And he said, come here, man. He pulls me around this big beverage cooler. Give me one a little privacy. He just said, he says, uh, I just want you to know, he said, I'm really appreciative of the role. So this is a guy that's played for the Yankees, playing for the Los Angeles Angels. Angels, doesn't really have any connection to Detroit or Michigan. Or oh, except as a visiting ball player. Except and he, as a visiting ball player. And, of course, as the place where that he's home run. Titanic. So Detroit's always been front and center. And Reggie is always savvy. He, he knew the writers. He and I had had a little debate. It was a really cool debate. Just a few months earlier out there, I was trying to, to get some comments from him on uh, a guy that Tigers had traded to the Angels to make a long story short. But he liked the back and forth. He wasn't going to say anything. And his words, to, now that I'm into the story, he says, Lenny, he says, I'm not, he says, I know what you guys want. He says, I'm not going to even talk about it. I said, Reggie, I said, you don't know me. He goes, okay, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> so he knew me enough to where when I when he saw what I had written, and you know, I never thought twice about it. It's just a note within a column. When he tapped me over and said, I just want you to know how much I appreciate that. Well 20 years later. Oh no, this was that week. About 15, the home run. About the home run, but it was had taken place 15 years ago. 15 years. But, but I, I made it part of an overall tribute to the fact that he'd always been so dramatic, it, the entertainment dollar had always provided from him dividends uh, immeasurable compared with other athletes. And I still yeah. believe that. He, he, he had a way, no matter what the situation was, to make it a Reggie yeah. game. Yeah. And on top of that, he was such a great, great, great hitter. I loved him. He was my favorite out-of-town athlete all through the year. He, he was so bright, just a fantastic interview, no matter when it was. So Reggie was, was a favorite. But yeah, I, I could say that about hockey players, Brett Hull uh, of the Red Wings. Oh, my gosh. Darren McCarty to know a lot of the Lions, Lem Barney. These are all Hall of Famers from now from some years back. And I covered the Bad Boy Pistons, too. Okay. Well, there's plenty of material yeah. there. So, so I covered those. Lem Beer and Isaiah Thomas and, and Rick Mahorn and Vinny, the microwave and – 
They used to just brutalize. They were, they were they, the bad boys were named the bad boys, not for nothing. Dennis Rodman. I enjoyed covering those teams a lot. That was good theater and drama there too. So I had a very blessed experience. Then I covered the University of Michigan, covered basketball and, and football over there as well as in Michigan State. Yeah. So if there were primary guys during those years, I was usually exposed to them and usually got to know them, including the coaches, whether it was Bo Schembechler or Lloyd Carr or uh, George Perlis at yeah. Michigan State or Nick Saban. Of course, Nick Saban and I had a long relationship too, dating to the 80s. Mm -hmm. And Nick is my favorite coach because I knew how good he was even at a young age before he became a head coach. I knew how good he was going to be. In 2004, we were sitting at Harry Bissett's in Athens mm -hmm. after a shellacking of LSU. Nick Saban led LSU by University of Georgia, coached by Mark Richt. It was a huge game. They had Jamarcus Russell as their quarterback, who brilliant at times and then not as brilliant. But I remember you said, I asked you, who's the best college coach right now? And after a 35-point loss, you said Nick Saban. And then since then, he's only proven you're right. Again, not only had I known that as an assistant, because I saw even when he was 32 and that defensive coordinator, how brilliant he was and how good he was at coaching. When we used to have access to practices, that was one thing I loved about the old-time sports writing. You used to be able to go to practice at will. And that was great. I'd, I'd go over every night, and get the stories, and you talk to the coaches after, talk to the players after. You had all the access you wanted. I'd seen it with Nick. And then, of course, I'd seen it when he became a head football coach at Michigan State. And I covered that. I, you might say the story I wrote about him is the one that triggered him getting hired there. That's when he was a defensive coordinator with the Browns under Bill Belichick, and Belichick was with the Browns. They were on their way to the playoffs. Michigan State was going to fire George Perlis. I thought Nick could be the guy that they, they needed to hire. I just wrote a story, but I called down there uh, to the Browns to see if he could – I don't want to go down a, a bad alley here. Maybe you don't want anything to do with Michigan State in this opening. Maybe you're happy in the NFL, but I needed to know. Well, he called me back, and we talked off the record for a half hour. Ah, and he made it clear, oh, Terry and I love East Lansing more than any place we've been. I said, well, I said, this is going to be like setting a match to dry tinder because the fan base is going to go nuts. Thinking oh, so even at that time, people had caught wind of it being... They did through my story. But I was, for some reason, they hadn't discussed him as a successor to George. I, I didn't think there was anyone else that should be considered. Well, he got the job. And I even went on recruiting trips once because I wanted to see what it was like to go on. And he allowed it. I just rode in the car with him and the assistants when they went from one place to another. I watched him work the high school coaches and how that whole, it was fascinating to get that kind of insight into the recruiting process. I hated it when he left for LSU for after LSU. the 99 season. In which they went and played Florida and the Citrus Bowl. Yeah. And they had Plaxico Burris. And they beat Florida. Beat Florida 37 34, I believe. And Florida was very good at that time. This goes to show the level of discipline that all state teams have had. By that point, he had left for Baton Rouge. Oh, he didn't coach. Bobby that. Williams coached, but it was Nick's team. And they performed like Nick's team right yes. through the uh, bowl game. Wow, there's a lot there. So, Nick Saban, you were at what stood out for you to be able to have the confidence to write an article saying, we need to get Nick Saban as our next coach. He had not. Well, it, what, what I was writing, the, the tone would be Michigan State searching for a head football coach, a guy who is no doubt interested and who would seemingly be a fit for Michigan State. I'm writing this just as an objective appraisal of, the, of this. There's no endorsement. But I knew that if Nick Saban were interested, they'd be foolish not to be interested. And so this was a potential uh, relationship that needed to be explored. Again, Nick and I talked that day for off the record because that's very sensible. He's got a team going to the NFL playoffs as coordinator. George hasn't technically been fired yet. That was going to happen later that week, but we all knew it was going to happen. Yes. And so we worked out a quote that would be sensitive to his situation and sensitive to George because George had hired him as coordinator. He, he owed a lot in his career to George, but Nick was able to, to craft a very good quote, a very honest quote, without making the assumption George was already gone, without 
distracting from his work as defensive coordinator of the Browns in the playoffs. And that's, that's where you know, some skill has to, to really be executed through experience. The fundamental question I had was, let's just talk off the record. I got to find out if you're interested in this job. If you're not, there's not much of a story. Here. Oh, yeah. Terry and I would kill it. Oh, okay. Now I got my question. Let's talk back and forth here on the record. What can you say about this? And, and he, he got the, he, he, he thought the quote was perfect. And it was in the sense that it made it apparent that, yeah, he would come back happily if they would want to have him as head coach. Uh, I knew what the fan base was going to say. Oh, Nick Saban, are you say, kidding Hell me? yeah, we want Nick Saban. And they would have been dumb no. not to say Unfortunately, that. the, the MSU president, first of all, Nick inherited a mess. And it took a full five years to get that cleaned out. Yep. And then the president had not been to a football game, college football game, from the time he was a student to the time he was MSU president, about 40 years. What? And he thought Nick was a little inferior. He, he told me for the book that I wrote on Michigan State, I didn't think it was a good second half coach, the president said. Nick Saban is not a good second half coach. The reason this bozo said it is because they only had 71 players on scholarship because of all the attrition. Guys leaving, oh. guys flunking out. Yeah. They, well, they were cutting scholarships for a few years because of probation that George had encountered. So he didn't have a full complement of players till 1999. Well, guess what? They went 10 and 2. Those were the Drew Brees, Brees years at Purdue. Um, that was a big time for the Big Ten. It was. It was, it was good. good. Oh, oh, State oh was yeah. Good. It was fantastic. Wisconsin, Wisconsin was good. Wisconsin. They were all good. Those people, Jason, are the guys who stood out. There are four good examples. Those are really, really good examples. Gibson, Reggie. We, if we had all day, we'd get into Magic Johnson. I'm sure there's a lot Ooh. to unpack there. And maybe we'll do that on another segment. But let's close here. You watch football today. You watch baseball today. One thing that someone pointed out to me about baseball, because I don't know tons about the modern game, is there are not many Ozzie Smiths or Dustin Pedroyas. They're Everybody's huge now. And that's just a side note. What interests you right now about the modern baseball game and then also the modern college and pro football. The speed, of course, in the NFL is phenomenal. And the physics associated with it, the speed in the act in the heavier players, which is why concussions are more an issue now. Guys are getting hit harder at faster speeds with by more mass. Uh, one example is look at guys on punt formation, punt returners. If they're at the 10 yard line taking it, it used to be if you're at the 10 or the ball was going to Go over your head at the 10, the 9, the 8. You automatically just let, let it go into the end zone. It's going to be a touchback. Now they catch them all. The reason? The punters are kicking them higher, right? And the gunners are faster. And so if you let it hit the 10 or the 9 or the 8, you're going to have a guy at, at the end zone standing there to grab down it. it at the 1. That is a big example of how much speed has changed in the game just in recent years. Baseball, the fact that every team now has a 100-mile-an-hour or more yeah. guy uh, throwing, that used to be an anomaly even 15 years ago. You might have a couple in all of baseball. Now every team has at least one, on average, of a guy who can throw 100 miles an hour. And hitting, which is still the most difficult thing to do in sports, has gotten more difficult because of the 100 mile hour fastball, the change-ups, the curveballs, the sliders, the cutters, the splits. And so the most difficult task in sport has gotten even more difficult. And uh, that's one thing I've seen, which is yeah. kind of evident when uh, you see how many guys are fighting just to put it in, in bullpen games. Yeah. You didn't used to have those. And you sure didn't have guys 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth who all came out firing 97, 98, 99, 100. Now you do. So you had – Middle relievers weren't power pitchers like they are. No. And, and in fact, it used to be you'd have a middle reliever that would go maybe even four innings if the guy got knocked out. Then you'd bring in your setup or your, your, your closer. Now it's, it's a, it could be a bullpen game, as we know, anywhere from the fifth inning on or fourth. And those guys are all going to throw hard. So that has been a tremendous transition and evolution in this game. Well, how would you close the, the interview or the conversation that hopefully we'll have no technical difficulties here? What would you say about your career? It's a blessed man who can say I enjoyed going to work every single day.
And uh, I had that career. I decided when I was 12, I wanted to be a sports writer living on a farm up in Michigan. I never lost uh, sight of that vision. You get involved in school in the paper and suddenly you're gaining uh, a lot of experience and getting to know a lot of people. And if you've got any aptitude at all, modest aptitude, I suppose, reasonable aptitude, uh, you can make a career out of it. And I was blessed to have that as my profession all my life. If I told you you can pick any sport at any level that you haven't covered yet, what would you do? No, I, I would say this, Jason, because of access, which is very important, Baseball is still my favorite because you can still get the clubhouse every day. You can still get some one-on-ones that it's almost impossible to do in the NFL. College football is that way now. They just bring guys out for mass interviews. There's none of the one-on-one stuff I used to thrive on. That changed everything, and it made it less fulfilling. I'll tell you the sport I love to cover, love to write about because it's a great writing sport, golf. Yeah, Golf, there's an intimacy to golf that I think intersects with the terrain and with nature and with elements and then the competitiveness, the fury of the competitiveness that makes it a fabulous sport to write. I could write golf and baseball, college football, because I still think the college game is more interesting in great part because of the institutional politics involved too at each campus and yeah. university. That was always a fascination in covering the Big Ten for as many years as I did. And I see it in the SEC. Of course, I love SEC football. And I finally got to yet another stadium I hadn't been to in South Carolina last month. Uh -huh. I'm trying to get to every SEC stadium at some point. I got, but because of you, I was able to take in between the edges back uh, yeah. even in 04. And I've been, uh, the, of course, the Swamp. I've been to South Carolina, I've been to Vandy, and I've been down the road. It's, it's a beautiful season, autumn for college football, being unmatched in terms of passion. And it was always fun to write to that passion. And uh, yet baseball provides equally an intimacy. My favorite assignment every year is spring training. I still help out there every year. And that's my favorite place in the world, spring training. Because it's you get your one-on-ones, you get your intimacy, you get the inner workings of just casual. It's yeah. back. I call it screen door baseball. And um, no one's lost a game yet, so everybody's in a good mood. Uh -huh. It's all fresh and revived and spirits are hot. It's my favorite assignment, bar none. Thanks for having this conversation with me. Hopefully this is the first and only round of this because I, my savvy, my tech savviness is still developing. It'll be fun, Jason. It's a good conversation. Thanks a lot. Len Henning.